I'm really excited to be here with you with you today. And it was great to see in the chat box that sense of excitement. And also, I noticed a lot of uh, curiosity. And I'm so glad to see that word because I think that is something that may hopefully be met in this session that we're going to be looking at today. Um, because what we're really going to be looking at is a different way of really thinking and conceiving about how we are as humans, who we are as humans, how we exist in, in our cosmos and the implications that has for what really what uh, we can hold for the future. So I will begin by uh, just sharing my screen and taking you through the presentation, as Matty said. And, and feel free, by the way, as I'm talking, if any questions, thoughts come up, to put them in the chat box so that we, then we can use that as kind of raw material for our Q&A after, um, after this kind of formal part of the presentation. So I'm going to start off by sharing my screen. And, and you should be able to then hopefully see me in the little corner there <clears throat> and um, see the screen itself. So um, what you can see is that the title is um, <clears throat> the same title as, the, as this new book that is coming out next spring, The Web of Meaning, Integrating Science and Traditional Wisdom to Find Our Place in the Universe. And well, you might ask, well, why do we need to find our place in the universe. Then we kind of <clears throat> already know where we are. But what I'm going to take you through is this sense that actually we took some wrong turns in our mainstream culture. Essentially, we are lost in certain ways. And that's what we're going to be looking at and looking at seeing how we can redirect to find, to find ourselves again in the right place. And I'll explain what I mean uh, by actually a personal experience um, I'm actually speaking to you from the San Francisco Bay Area um, in the United States. And it was just about a month ago or so that I and millions of other people right here in the Bay Area with me woke up to what felt like the apocalypse. It was a day without daylight, this blood red light um, coming through the smoke um, that um, never kind of woke up through that whole day. And what felt so <clears throat> terrifying for me and for basically all of us here in the Bay Area was knowing the reason for this, because uh, we knew that all through Northern California and, and the whole Northwest of this continent with this horrific vision of our shared future, the fires burning millions of acres. And of course, what made it even worse was knowing that this was just here right now, it was happening to Australia, a year ago, it's happening right now to the Amazon, and even worse, and it happened to the Amazon again last year. And we know the reason for all this that's going on is a global climate that is out of control and <clears throat> is headed in the wrong direction. Well, probably most of you are familiar with some sort of graph like this showing how our global emissions have been increasing um, and they're moving in the wrong direction, and we need to sharply reduce them to get to that one and a half degree Celsius um, warming, which would just about be consistent with some kind of maintenance of our civilization the way it is. But we're moving utterly in the wrong direction. Even the pledges and targets countries have made uh, still move us completely in the wrong direction. And what's terrifying about that is this realization that as we do that, <clears throat> we actually move to um, start to create reinforcing feedbacks, which can then push the temperature, the global temperature even higher to the point where serious scientists around the world are warning that our very civilization could be in risk of collapsing this century. But here's the thing, even if by some sort of magic bullet, we were able to you know, control the climate and where it's going, there is a much broader way in which our civilization has totally taken the wrong course on this earth we're in. And to get a sense of that, let's just sort of pull out quite literally a little bit and just um, take a moment to look at our earth, this beautiful planet, the only place we know of in the universe where life exists. And life came, arose on this planet billions of years ago and in all that time got richer and richer and then just in the last few decades 
one species was able to leave that planet, fly to the moon to take this incredible picture. We've developed this amazing technology, so powerful that it literally can change and is changing the whole shape of life on this beautiful planet. So the question is, how have we been stewarding this incredible power that we as humans have developed? Well, the tragic answer is that we've been doing a disastrous job. <clears throat> There's really vast ecological destruction across the board that we have been as a global civilization creating. Now, let's take you through just a few pointers of what I mean by this. Um, we have experienced since 1970, believe it or not, a 68% decline in animal populations worldwide. Rainforests are basically disappearing around the world. Even insect populations have been collapsing. And every dimension we look at, we just see the results of this vast ecological destruction. The UN is forecasting that by the middle of the century, there'll be 5 billion people facing water shortages. Um, we right now have begun what biologists uh, call the sixth great extinction of species since life began on Earth. Only this one is caused by one species, humans. The Tragically, we're looking at the virtual annihilation of coral reefs worldwide this century. And another forecast by the UN is that 95% of Earth's land will be degraded by the middle of this century. But to me, of all the statistics that just kind of blow my mind away, there's none greater than this one, which is that at the current rate, by 2050, there will be more plastic by weight in the ocean than fish. Hard to believe. Now, I, as Mate said, I spent a number of years uh, looking, focusing my attention on what are these structures of thought, the ways of thinking that have led our civilization to this place of like total unsustainability. And a lot of those ideas um, were published in this book uh, that got published a couple of years ago called The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning. I looked at the different ways in which cultures made sense of the universe all the way from hunter-gatherer times to the present. And what came out of that book, the, the crystalline essence that came out is simply this, that culture shapes values throughout history and values are what shape history. And by that same token, we recognize that our values are what will shape the future. So let's just take a moment to look at what our values are about. Well, our modern dominant values are values that are based on a sense of separation. And that sense of separation has created a whole story around it that many of us around the world just take for granted. And the story goes like something like this. It says that nature is a machine. It says that humans are separate from nature that humans are separate from each other. It says that human progress arises from the conquest of nature and that the earth is really just this resource to exploit for human benefit. And finally, what the story tells us is that really the purpose of life is to get wealthy and powerful. Now, as I've researched these ideas and looked at what scientists as well as wisdom traditions tell us about these ideas, I came to realize that in fact, every one of these statements are absolutely false. They're not just dangerous and taking us to this point of potential collapse, but they're plain wrong. And that's what I'm, I am describing in this new book, The Web of Meaning, that is gonna be coming out next spring. And the subtitle of this book is Integrating Science and Traditional Wisdom to Find Our Place in the Universe. And um, so what this book actually does is that it integrates what we found in recent decades from modern sciences like neuroscience, complexity science, evolutionary biology, system sciences. Um, and it synthesizes those findings with the traditional wisdom that has arisen over millennia from indigenous knowledge from great wisdom traditions like Taoism and Buddhism. 
And it shows that all these different um, insights and disciplines together point to the same understanding of our intrinsic connectedness. And from that, we're able to develop a new story of connectedness. <clears throat> One that basically says, we are all interconnected in a web of meaning. And that's what I'm gonna take you through in the rest of this presentation. And the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes looking at each of some of the key existential questions that each of us as human beings ask at some point in our lives. Questions like, who am I? Where am I? What am I? How should I live? And finally, why am I? So let's begin with this first question, who am I? In each case, I'm gonna look at what our modern culture and civilization tells us as this received story, and then look at how we can make sense of these questions in a different way. So, well, in answering this question, who am I? Our mainstream culture basically comes back to this quote from Descartes, probably the most famous quote in all of philosophy, <clears throat> that simply goes, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. This is the foundation stone, essentially, for almost all uh, Western-based philosophy that has arisen since then. But if you look at what that statement says, and look at the implications, it's basically a saying <clears throat> that human identity exists solely through our conceptualizing faculty. And as a result of that, it then says that, well, then, therefore, animals and even our own bodies are just mere machines. The only thing that is truly existent, that's truly alive is that thinking faculty. But what modern biologists have shown us so clearly is that animals are most definitely not machines. And we can just look at a few examples of that. Like if we look, for example, at elephants, incredible, uh, creatures in Africa. They communicate over hundreds of miles through infrasound. They perform ceremonies together over dead family members. If we look at dolphins and whales, um, biologists have discovered they talk in local dialects. They actually call each other by name and they'll even gossip uh, about um, those who are temporarily absent. If we look at wolves, um, you see this deep family commitment, seeing males helping to raise their young until they reach maturity. And that kind of sentience, that intelligence doesn't just stop with animals. And um, even plants, they seem so um, kind of still and, and simple. They, we've been, uh, scientists have discovered now in recent years, have a networked intelligence, like a distributed intelligence. Plants actually experience the world in up to 20 different senses. They actually act intentionally and purposefully. They learn, they have memories, they communicate with each other and they even allocate resources as a community. Some of you may have heard of something that's been discovered called the wood wide web where in a forest and trees will actually communicate and allocate resources with each other through a mycorrhizal fungal network that connects them around through the entire forest. Here's the thing, even if we go deeper down to single cells, the very um, core of every living creature on this earth, even a single cell displays stunning intelligence. Cell biologists have begun to understand and, and report. Every single cell, has thousands of, in your body, like has thousands of sensors and proteins. Each cell sends and receives hundreds of signals. It's aware of itself and others. It knows what to do. It's, it cooperates in community. And then the cells actually make decisions as a group. Now, while the Western way of thinking for centuries just dismissed all this, had no understanding of it, just thought of animals as machines, other cultures had a very different perspective. And if we go look at 
and that China, for example, all the way back thousands of years ago, um, we see a very different way of understanding what the natural world is about. Many of you may be familiar with um, this great classic, the Tao Te Ching, which is actually you know, the second um, most uh, translated and published book other than the Bible in the world. Now, this book, the Tao Te Ching, is translated as um, the classic of Tao and De. Now, some of you may know what Tao actually means. It means like the way or path. It's like the um, ancient Chinese view of how the forces of nature manifest in the world. But De is equally important. It's this sense that the Tao has had of the spontaneity in, of the intrinsic nature that is inherent in all living things. And when they looked at the natural world and they saw how living things acted in the state of De, they called that acting with what they called Wu Wei, which translates as like effortless action. And they saw all of non-human nature acting naturally in this kind of way of Wu Wei. And then when they contrasted that with human activity, they developed and their own sort of theory of civilization, which was described by one of their great philosophers, Zhuangzi, who talked about how well the men of old shared the tranquility which belonged to the whole world a state of perfect unity. People lived in common with birds and beasts and were in terms of equality with all creatures as forming one family. But then, according to the Taoists, uh, civilization began to develop and through the rise of agriculture and, and technology. And then they said, in Zhuangzi's words, people began everywhere to be suspicious with extravagant orchestras and gesticulating ceremonies. Men began to be separated from one another. So from that, the Taoists developed like a theory of what happened to humans, that we may have started like other creatures with this Wu Wei, this effortless action, but then we developed what they called Yu Wei, purposive action, which the really the kind of elements of civilization, they describe it as the sort of faculty that you use a fire to dry up a well or forcing water uphill to irrigate a mountainside, essentially going against nature rather than with nature. Now what's fascinating is that now thousands of years later, cognitive neuroscientists have essentially validated <coughs> this Taoist understanding. They've discovered that the front of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, is actually what mediates that new way cognition. It's what's responsible for things like symbolic thought, for conceptualizing, planning, creating abstractions, all those things that Descartes thought was the only true human identity. And anthropologists have come to realize that it's that emergence of symbolic thought in ancient history that led to language, culture, art, and toolmaking, essentially just like that Taoist theory of civilization. So it's what we have as we look now through understanding from modern cognitive neuroscience is that really humans have a dual human consciousness. We have this animate consciousness that's intuitive, it's fast, that it contains our emotions, it's effortless. And that's a lot like that Taoist notion of Wu Wei. And at the same time as humans, we have a conceptual consciousness, what Descartes thought was our only consciousness, analytic, slow, rational, and effortful. And that is what is more like um, that Yu way that the Taoists recognized. <clears throat> so what that leads us to recognize that actually our human challenge is not to just um, identify as that pure conceptual consciousness, but to integrate both systems in harmony. So then when we look at how we might begin to answer that first question, who am I? we can say something like, well, I am a mind-body organism, one that's capable of integration. So let's move on to the next question. Where am I? Well, again, if we begin by looking at our received mainstream view of the cosmos, it basically gives us this notion of a split universe, that somewhere there's this dimension of some sort of transcendent God, and that's utterly split from this material world that our bodies live in. And in this past century or so, um, religion and science 
have come to this kind of a place of coexisting in different domains in this universe. So religion is meant to relate us to that transcendent place and science is meant to just kind of tell us about the material world. But that split understanding of the universe is what has led to in many ways to this unsustainable worldview where it feels like it's okay for many people to pray to that transcendent source of meaning. Meanwhile, while we ransack nature below, but again, if we look at different ways of making meaning around history, and we go once again back, in fact, to China, um, what we see is a very different understanding, making sense of the cosmos. So about a thousand years or so ago, in what was known as Song Dynasty, China, the school of philosophers developed what they call the school of the Tao. And this school of the Tao was actually kind of unique in history in a way because it synthesized three of the great traditions in the Chinese worldview. One was Taoism, another was Confucianism, another was Buddhism. And when they created this kind of grand synthesis of these three traditions, um, they called it the school of the Tao, but we know it um, in the West ever, nowadays by the term Neo-Confucianism. And for these Neo-Confucian philosophers, the universe was anything but um, split in that way. They saw the entire universe consisting of what they called qi, which uh, we can really roughly translate as matter and or energy. But just as importantly um, was the way in which that qi was connected. And um, they it was connected by principles that they called li. And when they looked at that li, those principles of connection, they looked at the totality, the totality of all the Li in the universe as the Tao. Now, fast forward a couple, um, you know, basically a thousand years, and when we look at what modern systems sciences are beginning to understand as they look at the universe, whether it's complexity science, systems biology, chaos theory, once again, they're beginning to point us to that to a connected universe, just like those Neo-Confucians did. They're beginning to recognize that everything in our earth is connected, but in nonlinear ways. And they've begun to see that the interactions between things tell us more about them very often than the things themselves. So whether it's starlings flocking in the sky or schools of fish in the ocean or the ripples of sand dunes, or even the entire living system of Earth, and even the ways in which galaxies are structured. And they found that it's those connections between those things are oftentimes more important than the actual stuff of which they're made. And when they've looked at those connections, they've discovered something really fascinating. They've seen universal patterns in nature, many of which are fractal. Now, a fractal is a pattern that repeats itself at different scales. And when you see it in nature, it indicates self-organized activity. And we see it everywhere in the natural world. We see it in the patterns of coastlines, of leaves, of lightning, <clears throat> the patterns of our lungs, and the, um, the shape and patterns and structures of our neurons. And when scientists have looked at the whole of nature on Earth, they've recognized that nature itself really is a fractally connected system where every cell is actually part of bigger systems and forms organisms. And each organism is fractally part of a species and each species then becomes part of an ecosystem. And each ecosystem ultimately is fractally connected with the entire living earth that we, uh, we might call Gaia. So when we ask ourselves this question, where am I? We can begin to come up with this new answer to this question. We can begin to say that actually I am part of a fractally connected, self-organized universe. So let's move on to that third question. Well, what am I? Well, those Neo-Confucian philosophers from a thousand years ago thought this was a crucially important question to ask. Their leading philosopher, his name was Chu Shi, famously said, 
If one wishes to know the reality of Tao, one must seek it in one's own nature. So if we look at our own nature and we try to understand it through the lens again of modern mainstream thinking, well, this is what we come up with. It's basically this kind of selfish gene understanding, this concept that Richard Dawkins popularized some decades back and has really influenced so much of mainstream thought throughout the world. <clears throat> and in Dawkins' world, the answer to what am I is very simple. We and all other animals, he says, are machines created by our genes in a highly competitive world. And the predominant quality to be expected from that, from a successful gene, then he says, is ruthless selfishness. So from that, there's a general understanding now in our mainstream culture that the gene is the fundamental unit of evolution, that it dictates everything about the organism, that, and that it's inherently selfish and competitive. Well, once again, what we found in recent decades advances in evolutionary biology and many, many subsections of this, of this discipline have shown each of these three statements to be absolutely false. First off, let's look at this question of the fundamental unit of evolution. It turns out that actually genes are part of an iterative process with the cell, far from dictating what the cell does or what it should do. It's part of a vibrant, dynamic, circular flow of interactivity with the cell. In fact, we can really think of the genotype as more like an artist's palette, uh, like a repertoire of capabilities that the cell, not the gene, but the cell can select based on its particular needs as determined by the environment. So we see the cell actually interacting with the gene instead of being dictated by the gene. And to get a sense of that, just give you one simple example. Um, well, you know, we all know this kind of um, cute little grasshopper sitting on a leaf. It's gentle and solitary. Well, it turns out that that grasshopper is actually has exactly the same genes, the same DNA as a swarm of aggressive locusts that you know, it can devour um, entire countries' uh, crops. Um, and the difference between these two is simply the way that the grasshopper at times um, starts to get into expressing its genes in a different way to become that locus. So the cell and the organism are what really determines what it's going to become. Well, what about the so-called selfishness of the gene? Well, it turns out that actually, if we look at the how life evolved to become increasingly complex over billions of years on Earth, every one of these major steps in complexity were the results of an increase in cooperation from single cells billions of years ago to the rise of complex cells, multicellular life, the um, emergence of simple animals and then mammals and then humans now. This, it's, each of these steps have been coming from increased cooperation. In the words of biologist Lynn Margulis, in fact, life did not take over the world by combat, but by networking. And the key to life in this networking, crucial element of all of this, is the sense of symbiosis, the way of relating between organisms so that it becomes a win-win for each organism rather than a zero-sum game, creating this beautiful harmonic dance of life that we see in nature all around us right now with, between plants, and those mycorrhizal fungal networks and insects and animals fertilizing the earth. And all these things together are all a result of the symbiosis of nature, organisms working together with each other. So it turns out that actually organisms themselves are in fact self-organized, fractal, dynamic patterns. In the words of systems biologist Carl Wosa, he says, organisms, we need to understand them as resilient patterns in a turbulent flow, in an energy flow. And he says, it's becoming increasingly clear to understand them in any deep sense. We must come to see living systems, not as machines, but as stable, complex, dynamic organization. 
So when we ask ourselves now, what am I? We can begin to answer that question from this foundation point of what I am is a resilient pattern of self-organized cooperation. So we might then ask, how does that affect how should I live? This fundamental question. So again, if we begin to answer that question by looking at what our mainstream culture tells us, well, it's kind of a sad but clear story that we're told. Actually, um, we're told humans are intrinsically selfish and greedy. Um, and that's not even such a bad thing. Many uh, and cultures, many aspects of people tell us because greed is good. Um, and we're told that capitalism works so well because the selfish behavior by individuals um, is in the best interest of everyone, at least the most efficient economy. And even people who don't buy into this uh, capitalist notion, and uh, to his credit, Richard Dawkins is one of them, sees things in terms of this combat between our nature and morality. We need to overcome, he feels, our, our selfish genes. So uh, he, among others, says things like, let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. So we need to understand what our selfish genes are up to because then we can have the chance to upset their designs. But there's actually a very different way of looking at how we should live our lives based on who we truly are. And again, if we go back to what systems biologists have now begun to understand of what life is about, they see it basically based on um, what this word that they use called autopoesis, which uh, essentially means like life's self-creation or self-generation. And they look back all the way to the very beginnings of life, billions of years ago, and they see it as life basically um, taking entropy out of the universe and actually turning it into this self-organization that it then self-generates to create more of itself. And over billions of years, what life, uh, what we see in life uh, ultimately is a deep purpose of life itself, which is very simply to create more life. And that deep purpose is what's led to this incredible, rich, abundant, fractal cascade of abundance that we see around us all in the earth. And as humans evolved, we're no different from that core element of what all life is about. And it turns out that human flourishing because of that is also fractal. So for every one of us human mind body organisms, we're really part of a deep fractal pattern. We're part of community. And every one of our communities are a part of the tiny little part of this entire living earth. Now, while systems biologists are beginning to understand this, this deep insight is something that indigenous cultures around the world have known for millennia. So if we look actually here in North America, where I am, uh, the Lakota people, for example, have um, a key term they call mitakuye oyasin. We are all related. And they're not just referring to their own actual extended family. They're referring not even just to all humans, but all of life on earth. And if we turn to Africa, there's this great profound concept in Africa known as Ubuntu, which basically translates as I am because you are. And that's a fundamentally different way to look at what life is and therefore how we should live our lives. And based on that, we recognize that actually flourishing can be based and is based on our intrinsic connectedness within ourselves, with others, with the natural world, and with the living earth. And from this understanding um, comes a very different conception of what a value system can look like, an alternative life-based value system, which was beautifully expressed um, last century by Albert Schweitzer, the great humanitarian, who said, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And from that understanding, he developed this incredible profound sense of saying, I cannot but have reverence for all that is called life. 
that is the beginning and foundation of morality. So from that, we can begin to answer this question of how should I live from this different foundation that I should live in reverence and care for all life. Which then leads us to looking at this final question. Why am I? And if we turn one more time to what our mainstream dominant culture tells us, well, the answer is pretty sad. Um, we live in a pointless universe is what we're told. In, the, in these words of Steven Weinberg, a Nobel laureate um, physicist, um, who's really a, a, a spokesperson for this reductionist worldview. He says, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. But if we look at the universe from this place of connectedness, we begin to actually recognize that meaning itself is a function of connectedness. Just think about how as the number of connections increases within a system, they lead to a phase transition, which ultimately leads to the emergence of new meaning. And we can actually see this in different aspects of our life. And like we know it, like when words connect, altogether, when enough of them connect, language emerges. When organisms connect, we know an ecosystem emerges. When neurons connect in our brains and nervous system, consciousness emerges. Now, some of you may have had in your life some kind of peak experience when you've sensed all through your being that sense of oneness, that sense of deep connectedness. Well, that's something now that um, modern systems thinking has validated as a true understanding of what our universe actually is about, that um, traditional wisdom systems have told us for millennia. But this connectedness has important implications with it. It tells us that everything you do in your life creates those ripples of Li, which affect everything else in the universe this ultimate principle of the ultimate connectivity of everything in the universe. <clears throat> Essentially, we exist in an ocean of Li. And those Li ripples begin within each of us. And therefore, the choices we make, the personal choices and actions, the choices to participate, um, in regenerative communities, the choices to engage in a broader political process. All of these choices that we make together weave the web of meaning. So when we ask ourselves, why am I? One way we can begin to explore our own answer to that question is to say, I am here to weave my part in the web of meaning. And if enough of us do that together, creating this broader web of meaning around all the human community, we can begin to regenerate our beautiful, fragile earth. So thank you for listening so much um, uh, to, uh, to that talk. And if anyone's interested to find out more about my work, you take a quick screenshot of this. This is my book, The Patterning Instinct, new book coming out next spring. And, you can connect with me on these websites um, on the web. And um, at this point, let me uh, get out of this presentation mode and join you more in person. Thank you so much for that. And uh, let me pass things back over to you, Mate, to facilitate our next uh, discussion from here. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm so happy that you chose to connect with us on the confluence.